Morning, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, before I start, well, a quick pop trivia question. Anyone want to stick their hand up and name any of these three guys? I think far right's quite easy. Anyone? Neil and Musk, yeah. Any of the other two? No takers? I'll get your pint in the bar later. No? Okay. So far left um, is a chap called Gordon Moore from Intel. In the middle, we have Masayoshi-san from SoftBank, and of course, we have Elon Musk. Um, Gordon Moore is the, the, the guy who kind of stated Moore's Law uh, back in the, I think, 60s, early 70s. And his, his statement was something a little bit willier than we now use, just around the pace of uh, technology change and how quick it would, um, it would ramp up. But really, what he stated was that the processing power of technology, of computing, would double roughly every two years. And doubling every two years is an exponential growth rate. And exponential curves get really quite exciting as they, as they grow. He reckoned that would last for, I think he's quoted as saying, about 10 years, and then it would plateau. It hasn't really stopped. So we are still on an exponential growth rate of technology in general. He was talking specifically around processors, but I think technology in general is moving at that kind of pace. And maybe to pick up on what the minister said earlier, talked about change has never happened so quickly before. I think there's another great quote, is it's also, this is now the slowest pace at which change will ever happen. Again, another way to express exponential. This is the fastest it's ever been, but it's also the slowest it will ever be. Uh, Elon Musk is probably a little bit more doom and gloom and slightly more out there. Um, he worries a lot about artificial intelligence and what it might be about to do in the workplace and elsewhere. Uh, DeepMind is Google's uh, AI project. He, I think, has been very connected to that. And he worries quite a lot about what's about to happen. He talks about job disruption, um, and I think he does use the phrase singularity, but I'll get on to that in a little second. Masayoshi-san, if you don't know, he's the founder of SoftBank. Um, they have currently, I think it's a $93 billion vision fund, entirely focused on investing in next generation tech. I heard recently, I don't know if that's true, but they're going to double through the size of the fund. So roughly $200 billion channeled that next generation technology. He again talks about in a different way, the same thing. He talks about a metal collar workforce, maybe to pick up on a lot of stuff there around robotics. That's coming, there's absolutely no doubt. In one form or another, that's coming to all industries and certainly coming to construction. He then starts to think, well, what does that mean for us as humanity, as people? Um, I quite like this one, and this is probably where I'll, I'll take this piece of the, the, the kind of conversation to. I think if you read anything about the singularity, and the singularity, for, there's a variety of definitions, but it's the point at which AI or robotics outstrips us, outstrips our ability to do something very sci-fi, somewhat dystopian. But that's the point at which the computers can do just about everything we can do, but probably better and faster. And that includes all the things that we kind of think are uniquely human, you know, creativity, design, etc. So it isn't just the quick repetitive tasks. The rate of change of technology is going to show us that the AI ability and robotic ability will move into our spaces very quickly. And we're not talking about 200, 400, 1,000 years time. Most people talk about the singularity happening 30 to 40 years time, within a generation. When my kids are my age, this is the time frame we're talking about. We will probably all see it. Um, so the last piece on, on Masayoshi Son, he was asked why, you know, why are you establishing a vision fund? Uh, I have only one reason, the singularity. So his entire focus is that. Well, a couple of commentators, really just to pick out the date. The Turing test is, is the, is the kind of often quoted test for the point at which computers can be seen to be having human traits and to pass a series of tests. Many people put that well within the next 30 years that we'll see the first Turing test being passed by computers, by AI. Um, again, just another aggregation of the, 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 the kind of thinking out there. 2040 to 2050 is roughly that point. So, I don't want to depress you all, right? But that, to me, is the landscape we're in. That's the context of technology that we're in at the moment. Um, I'll introduce myself properly. 
Um, so I'm Marty McDonald, founder at the Solus Group and co-founder and CEO at Sublime. A very short piece on each company, just to give you context. Uh, Solus has been around for about 18 years, uh, with 50 odd staff in Glasgow and London. Um, and Solus's purpose and kind of operation has been entirely in creating high-end niche digital content for the construction and architecture sector. That's the beautiful images and movies that typically go alongside new projects that help communicate what that project is going to be. So that's the 18 year history. In more recent years, we've pioneered the use of AR and VR into that sector to enable clients and more importantly, their audiences to engage better in a project, to be able to go and visit the future, to go and visit a project before it's built and maybe take part and collaborate in that design process. Um, we're very R&D driven, you know, we, we try and build the next great thing. And we certainly adopted games engines very early. In 2010, we built a good chunk of Gatwick Airport um, in the Unity games engine. That was quite far ahead of the curve. And I guess that's where we tend to live uh, as a business. So, so it's a service business for a bunch of cool, creative people that do great stuff. Um, but within that business, Certainly I um, had begun to realize there was quite a few industry problems, sort of technical problems in the kind of CAD and 3D workflows. And then as VR came along, how you get from where we typically are in Revit or another, another software package to a VR experience. And we started to solve those problems. We hired developers for the first time. And having done that, we realized we kind of had something here. We had an ability and the potential to deliver solutions for the market. And in, doing, and in realizing that, we decided to break that out into a separate company and spin it out. Uh, that went on to become Sublime. So I spend most of my time these days in Sublime. I'm CEO, um, and that is a tech startup in the sort of Silicon Valley style with a good dose of Glasgow attached. So we, 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 think, we, can, we think we can maybe remove some of the crazy excesses of a Silicon Valley startup, but hang on to that if you like, slightly crazy ambition, that moonshot view of where we need to get to very quickly to solve some of the big problems that we are facing and some of the opportunities that those kind of challenges represent. Uh, so we launched May 17. Uh, we're about 20 staff and recruiting heavily at the moment, mostly based in Glasgow, headquartered in Glasgow, uh, but we also have a place in Dubai. Um, and the takeoff period's been incredible. It's been fantastic. Um, and we've picked up a lot of really interesting customers. And our mission is to take those VR and AR technologies, and I'll do a bit more detail in a second, and kind of show how they can be used really usefully and actually deliver ROI back into the construction and design process. And we also have benefited from, and I'll cover uh, some really, um, really useful, visionary um, sort of projects that we've submitted for UK government R&D grants. Um, and um, I won't do any politics, but um, in terms of how the UK government is supporting R&D at the moment, it is a, a really kind of strong area uh, for us in the UK. Just what we talk about at Solus, building memories of the future. We can deliver to you a memory of what the future is going to be like um, and to give that lasting impact. As I say, Solus has been around for 18 years. We've worked on a whole series of really cool <laughs> interviews. In I'll skip past the movie just now, so 1,700 projects over that period, so a lot, a lot of those are smaller, um, and I'm sure you recognize what the kind of high-end CGI imagery and movies that would go on to support a project of a variety of scales. That's actually the Gatwick Airport project I spoke about earlier. Uh, those images were produced through a more traditional CGI process, but at the same time, we delivered the client what we call a real-time model. So they could use a computer games controller in 2010, a pair of 3D glasses, not quite VR, but the kind of cinema style 3D glasses, and they could walk through anywhere they wanted to go in their new project, and they could then take their clients. And in their case, their clients were typically the retail uh, companies that were going to potentially let some of the units, and they could walk them to the unit. They could talk about the footfall, uh, the demographic, the wayfinding, et cetera, that, that, that would make one unit better over the other. And I think it was a very successful tool for them at that stage. Do loads in the hospitality sector, worked a lot with the Radisson brands over the years. We often do some pretty large scale master planning stuff, uh, a lot happening in the Middle East at the moment. Uh, and also, um, I guess the real kind of traditional home for CGI is selling high-end property, whether that's commercial or residential, and we do lots of that. 
short video reel here just to give you a flavour. something just quite smart on an iPad or actually quite often maybe even just using a large screen but being able to interactively walk through a really beautiful looking model uh, directly from Revit and other packages these days you've almost got a one button push to produce a really beautiful imagery or view whereas previously you maybe had to hire a company like Solus to get you to a really beautiful image we can do that quite automated these days and I think for client engagement it's pretty amazing that if you can sit a couple of weeks into some conceptual design and go and visit that future in a really realistic way. So I guess that's Solus's backstory. That leads us pretty much up to 2017. Um, and I kind of explained the idea behind Sublime was really to take that technology or, or kind of tech solution capability we'd built within ourselves at Sublime and spin that out. And that was the kind of nascent piece for, for Sublime. I do phrase it a different way. I am that geek kid from the 80s. I was always playing all the old computer games. And I genuinely have always wanted superpowers. So I, I have always had that. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could just fly or teleport or, I don't know, have telepathy? And I've watched all the movies and read all the books. So that's, that's definitely my personal background here. And I guess if you look at our demographic in the company, we're kind of a bunch of geek kids who kind of came out of this sci-fi world and still, I mean, some of our guys, probably my age or older, get together at lunchtime and race each other on the Switch at Mario Kart, right? So that's who we're talking about, that's who we are. I guess there's more to it than that because I did a little troll of the web on superpowers and started to pick a few out. Precognition, I think, would be pretty damn cool in construction if we knew what was going to happen before it happened, particularly on a construction site. Similarly, had spidey sense, then we can probably take away all the various things that go wrong in a construction site. We'll see things just before they happen. We'll sense it before it happens. I think super intelligence, superpower, but that ability to share and pull our knowledge and our capabilities. X-ray vision, totally. Who didn't want X-ray vision? If I could see through the floors or the walls, then I'd begin to have some pretty cool capabilities, again, from a construction point of view. Time travel, totally awesome. Let's move, but again, can we fly forward in time? Can we realistically have a, a future experience? And can we teleport ourselves to somewhere else? Again, in a, in a construction design concept, wouldn't it be awesome if I could do 20 site visits in a day? And I could just teleport and then be back in my office or back home. Awesome, let's work from home. Let's just teleport everywhere. So telepathy, sorry, I forgot telepathy, of course, the ability to share thoughts instantaneously. So yes, this is the context I was coming from, whoever you fancy in your own sci-fi world, George LaForge. He has augmented, that's his augmented reality view in the world. He can see heat and he can see all sorts of things. Uh, my favorite game, so Juice X, he is an augmented human. So he has augmented gravity, there's all, men, all manner of human augments. And that stuff's coming and it's, it's not terribly far in the future. My favorite author by a mile, Scottish author. If you're ever looking at any of his books and he has an M in his name, then it's his sci-fi stream. He's probably, from my mind, envisaged an entire societal future that is in totally AI enabled, we're way past the singularity, but it just shows in his vision how us as humans can actually continue post money society, post all sorts of things. But that envisaging is happening in sci-fi and I think it is useful. Uh, these guys, of course, the Marvel crew. Um, so sci-fi, 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 I've probably said sci-fi 20 times in the last three minutes. That's science fiction. Uh, the truth of the matter is an awful lot of what we've been busy in science fiction is rapidly becoming science fact. So this happened not too long ago in Glasgow. 
was I mine. He threw into the pet box in Glasgow. He's wearing a helmet that I'll show you in a second that we deployed a year before this in Scotland. So for all that this is definitely sci-fi inspired, that is Iron Man. He's holding to Iron Man and um, the brownies he's doing in. You can buy that shirt if you have enough hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is. But also he's wearing I would call it construction tech, he's wearing technology to be that supplying into our industry. And again, just to see the super sci-fi stuff is coming to Google and Samsung and others are patenting augmented reality contact lenses. Now, we can't build these things yet. It's far too difficult, super expensive. Battery and power is an impossible task at the moment. But they're patenting it because they believe that the curve and the rate of change of technology means in the not too distant future, we will be able to pop in a, a, a contact lens and have significantly more power than we carry around in our pockets and our smartphones delivered to us through a lens. Um, I talked variously about a, a whole range of emerging technologies. Loads of people would argue they've been emerging for a very long time, therefore they don't qualify. But I think we're beginning to see these things come to fruition. I think we go left to right, so that there's a bunch of fundamental technologies out there that are just going to shift our ability to do things. Look at uh, any of them, but quantum computing, the, the power shift or the, the ability to calculate it's in the many, many hundreds or thousands of times faster than what we can do today. That just changes like everything. So I think any one of these things is a seismic change. Put them together and we're delivering more than just a bit of disruption. We're really shifting the needle. Um, we create data massively today already and our rate of data generation is just rising on that exponential curve as well. In our sector, I think we're beginning to try and use technology to interpret all of that data, because data is just data. If we can interpret it and make it useful and give us some actionable insight, then we have something useful. For us, at the far right, VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality are the windows into that data world. There's so much stuff out there it needs interpreted and delivered to us in a really digestible manner, and we need to be able to access it all very quickly. This is our current access to our data world. We should really stop calling these things phones. I don't know many phone calls you make, but I don't make too many. This is our, I don't know, data access device, media playing device, definitely our social media device. Um, but all of that stuff, I think, that this format came out of being a phone for making phone calls. The size of the screen now is really about playing back media to us. When that isn't the requirement anymore, then I think we will definitely start to wear it. Um, I've said VR and AR a few times. Let me try and give you some definitions. I hate this, by the way. Uh, there are far too many. So we have VR, which I'm totally comfortable with. Virtual reality. It's a virtual version of the reality. Okay. AR, I quite like. Augmented reality. So the real world around us with a digital layer on top. Cool. Now it gets complicated. We have merged, mixed, real. It's real. I'm pretty sure this is real reality. Um, that's all realities, extended reality, and I never remember the last one. So there's too many. We throw an umbrella over the whole lot and just talk about digital realities. I think a lot of people are just shorting it to realities. I think it's sometimes weird because this is definitely reality. I really hope it is. So, so we talk about digital realities as a kind of blanket. So that is, again, I'm trying to context set here and then tell you what we're about to do, or what we have done very recently and what we're about to do next. So in Sublime, we are building technology in the virtual reality and augmented reality spaces. Those two we rename really into shared immersion and the augmented worker. I'll try and spend a good few minutes on the augmented worker at the end because that's what's coming next. And that's where I think the seismic change will come from. Today, I think throughout most, again, forward-looking architecture practices, design practices, and quite a lot of construction companies, we're beginning to see the use of VR, virtual reality headsets, goggles. Um, that's the poster child image that the kind of latest proper flush of the industry was launched with. That's the Oculus Rift. And he's having a good time. You know, he's like, ah, this is amazing. And it is. It's amazing. It's a, an incredible experience. There have been a few kind of slightly poor experiences. I think that's the choice of content and how it's delivered. Done well, a VR experience in a headset like this is awesome. And it's really useful. You can do great health and safety training for a construction site in a VR headset. And there are a variety of other things that are really good use cases. 
However, my problem, and I think the industry is beginning to have the same problem, is all of this is great, but strapping a big box to your face in a public scenario is pretty weird and not good. You end up looking a bit like this. So this is a, a journalist chap who did a couple of years ago, what's it really like to do VR and a quite like Muppet face? You know, you end up looking a bit foolish, but also when you're in there, it's solo, you're in there yourself, it's quite isolating, you're quite vulnerable in a public space. So I think in the comfort of your own home for entertainment, fantastic. And also in, a, in some settings like training, I think it is very useful. For us, we need to crack the sharing. It needs to be a shared experience. We all have body language. Certainly if you have a group thing and someone's leading, you want to point. We need eye contact. We need that human connection. And if technology is driving us away from the human connection, I think we're doing it wrong. So as we have, for me, we have to have this sort of shared experience. So this is our first take on how to improve that, is to have somewhere where we can step in and walk into it. And it's a space that's projected, but ultimately it's just VR. It's exactly the same VR experience. You can stand as humans, you don't need to wear any glasses, there's no technology requirement on you. And then if you start thinking about events, about retail, about all manner of public settings, then the ability to walk in together, possibly have a cup of coffee or tea or a glass of wine in your hand, and still just be totally human, but immersed and have that VR experience, then I think it begins to get a bit more powerful. So in the last couple of years, we've started to deliver across these sort of companies those sorts of solutions. And I think we're beginning to get that feedback loop as well from dealing with these guys to know what needs to be done next. Um, we say reality, reality, reality a lot. Virtual reality, how real is it, is a fair question. Um, and I think in really recent years, in the last two or three years, I should maybe say that sit sitting behind almost all VR that you'll see, virtual reality, is a games engine. Typically, Unity or Unreal, there are a few other outliers, but that's kind of what's driving the whole industry. So that games industry that's exploded in the last 20 odd years is now really feeding into us as enter and in our own sectors. And the beauty and quality that we're kind of maybe used to by default on a PlayStation game or something like that is very quickly becoming available to us. So I'll show you a film just now that, that shows our VR versus film, real film of the same space. So that's VR from Unreal they all that we away. created. And yeah, that's film of the same space. They could come back with the VR breakfast at night. And say, film of the same space. I probably don't need the sound for this. And then um, you, you so see the interaction. So this is the client, but that's our portal that you can stand within against. Yeah, eager to discover. You, so you, you can, can do it that really way or you can wear the headset. Showcase VR, what it film of the same be. space. So I would, I would claim reasonably boldly that that's kind of reality. We're convinced at that point. Our architects are convinced. We're spatially convinced that we're in the space. The best way to I think you need audio as well. I probably haven't touched much on audio. I think there are two primary senses that convince us that we are somewhere. And our sight, but really crucially, is our ears. We're not bats, but our ears really do a lot of spatial positioning for us. If you close your eyes and someone speaks, you can point to them no matter where they are around you. So that sound sourcing and that spatial awareness through your, through your ears is really quite important. So I think we often, and we are guilty as anyone, focus an awful lot on the visual. I think if you can get the visual and the audio together, you can convince your brain that you were somewhere. And a lot of our clients talk about when I walked up the stairs or when I came through the door or the view that I could see when I was in the living room. I think that tells you that their kind of basic perception was that they were somewhere else. And they call that presence. And I think if we can achieve presence, then we can claim teleportation, a bit of time travel, and maybe we're en route to some, some superpowers, you know. So that's, again, another example of the de deployment of our solutions. So these are what we call our portals. They're dome-shaped spaces. We have three, so four meters, six meters, and eight meters in diameter. And they fill your entire vision when you stand within them. And they deliver that VR experience, but with no headset. In this case, we had two sitting side by side for Radisson, delivering different experiences. But again, crucially, we can pop those up in a morning at an event. You deliver the content from your standard content workflow. That means that we built plugins for the likes of Revit, for the various games engines, Unity and Unreal. Any of you have seen Revis2, it's a kind of collaboration tool driven by iPad. We've plugged in Revis2 now, and you can stand with Revis2 here and have a one-to-one -one scale collaboration meeting in one of our portals. And we're continuing to build out that kind of workflow integration. So that's, I guess there's, there's a variety of purposes for that. I'll maybe cover very quickly. So I think the design collaboration piece is crucial. I mean, that meeting happens, I think, often in large uh, projects these days. 
but are winning. I mean, we, and we have incredible 3D data. Typically, we've built the whole thing in 3D. We've got it all. We maybe even have time-sliced construction sequencing in 4D. We maybe have a bunch of design options. And I think we then often look at them through a small flat box on the wall in a meeting room context. And I think the game changes and the conversation changes if you can open up the box and stand within it. And that, that very validly in a, in a headset as well as through anything else. And you do see a, a client conversation that changes entirely when you stand them in their building before you build it, or an end user. Let's take HS2 or a large infrastructure project. If you go up the line of HS2, which ARAP and others have done, and give people a quick immersive experience, their level of engagement multiplies by 10. So I think if you can engage people in that, using tech, but in a sort of human way, just let them see it and experience it, you get a really different outcome. Um, I guess maybe with most of these technologies, the first usage is in that kind of marketing promotional piece. Uh, and recently delivered this in the Middle East, which was four large installations, all with one form or another of super immersive technology that, or, or digital content that wrapped itself around you and delivered a vision of the future. Um, the first was about three minutes and then each of the other three were five minutes. And, and people talked, I've genuinely talked about when I was at the F1 circuit, when I was stood in the middle of the future football pitch or when I traveled down the, the central boulevard of the new, the new city. So again, in a group context with no requirement for a wearable, you can deliver time travel, you can go and visit the future. I'll play a short film of some of this stuff. that for us is shared immersion. That's what we can do today and I think are quite successfully doing today to deploy this technology. For us, what happens next is if we can take that same technology, really VR and AR are really kind of related technologies and turn it into or deliver it as AR on glass that we can wear, then I think we can take it right into our working day. I think VR today lets us maybe train in tasks, etc. But if we could carry all of that data all of that learning that we did in a training context onto the construction site or into our work environment, then we have this incredible facility to overlay digital in the world. I would still like to talk about super enhanced abilities or superpowers for the workers of the future. It's slightly flippant, but I do think it's valid. Um, I think then that's what we have tried to do. Um, we have been very well funded on two projects by Innovate UK. Uh, the first of those is Mobius. In, um, in collaboration with Glasgow University of Glasgow, where we're looking at the learning journey, how people learn, and learning about learning. And I think using VR and AR to deliver across 10 different kind of streams of activity, 10 different disciplines, and try and learn how people learn in VR. And that's only just starting, we're only a, a few weeks into that. But I think at the end of that, we will have learned an awful lot about how to deliver this stuff very well and it will feed more broadly into everything else that we do. The augmented work is then the, that's actually the first of those. Uh, it started a month earlier, it started in September. It's a three year program again, carbon dynamic and offsite, low energy uh, homes manufacturer in Scotland, and the AMRC in Sheffield are doing some of the best AR and VR I've seen. Uh, typically at the moment attached to automotive and aerospace. And I think again, the construction industry has got so much to learn from that space. I think if we take what the game sector has been doing, what those guys have been doing, and we can mesh it up, then I think we've got some amazing opportunities. And I've got a really cool steering group sitting behind us, giving us some advice and guidance what we're doing. 
big that technology is the helmet that enables you to Man's wear to digital the, eyewear, uh, digital glasses, and uh, uh, allow uh, for ago, the 3D information that exists and crucially uh, the database around uh, the, the project to, to be accessed in your eye line, uh, uh, hands free and heads up, which is crucial for safety on a construction site. And, and the last key element is the ability to the capture in the information from and the site and, and then push that back up works, to a database to maintain a live works. record. The challenge is that that headset is too expensive, the battery power isn't good enough yet, it doesn't actually sit very well, it's a bit too heavy and the hardware just isn't quite ready yet. That's the augmented worker kind of uh, roadmap, there's kind of five use cases in construction. I'll run through them very quickly. Um, this idea of real-time co-design engagement, the idea of being, us being able to together share an environment and look at, for this case, quite simply, a kind of office layout, and we could all test something out together. I think that idea of being able to share 3D in context, one-to-one -one scale, I think begins to open up a lot of doors. This one I love because I'm genuinely terrified of electricity. I'm scared to change a, a, a plug. But if I had this level of guidance, and it locks onto the real world. So if I'm looking at an electrical switch box and I'm looking over here and back again, I'm with a colleague, and my work instructions are locked onto step by step, the places that I'm, and don't cut the blue wire, and this thing over here is hot or is going to explode, don't touch these, then I would be a bit more confident. And I think what we're really envisaging is um, really skilled but not experienced engineers carrying out a really wide range of tasks. I think that is where a lot of this will go. And if we can superpower them, with wearable AI, then we kind of don't necessarily need to worry about the robots taking our jobs. We become ourselves more efficient and able to do more with less um, in the same time frame. If you get stuck on this digitally step guided piece, I think remote expert is going to be huge. So the idea again that we can dial in an expert into our world and they can mark up the world for us and say, oh no, you've got the wrong instructions or what no one thought to tell you was and they'll mark up and say this here, you need to unhinge that first or whatever that step is. And that being able to now teleport in or telepathy in someone else's experience and share their intelligence with you live when you need it, I think begins to get really interesting that maybe older workforce that would like to retire, but maybe they could do four hours a day on call from home, from the garden, from the golf course, from the beach, with a pad. They don't even necessarily need to use them. Quickly mark up something, £1,000 an hour, thank you very much, and sharing that experience that we don't want to lose out of the industry. And I think someone else touched on this, planned versus actual, being able to see overlaid one-to-one -one scale on the construction site, what was planned and where we're at, I think can begin to get really powerful. I love this one from a health and safety point of view. There's about five things that could happen here. And if we had precognition or spidey sense, then we're able to avert all manner of things going wrong. So if one of these two guys is on his phone when he shouldn't be, and he wanders into the path of the digger, but that's already known data sets, then he can get a parking beep, 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 beep. If he doesn't react, the machine can shut off, the site supervisor can get a notification. That could all be really easily automated. There's really cheap tech could do that today. Maybe one of these guys is asthmatic, and if a cloud of dust goes up, the supervisor again can see two people with asthma-related issues need to leave the site, or when this truck is reversing, its entire reversing path is plotted ahead of it, and everyone in its potential path are warned. Of this one as well, so the idea of a plant room where the glasses can actually see heat, so we've got heat vision, so we can see normal temperature, normal temperature, normal temperature, too high, too cold. And it can read valves, so it can actually check every valve in the room is set to the right place. And again, quickly check against data sets what's within normal tolerances. Again, also love this one. I think that we will see this soon, I believe. The ability to stand in a street, pop on some glasses as a, a, a worker, an engineer of some kind, and get x-ray vision. Be able to see straight through the floor to the locations of all services. And if there's a tiny little $1 IoT a sensor in each of these pipes. Maybe we'll get the live pipe float or the throughputs of each pipe or the flashing red dot on the thing that's gone wrong and its location and its best access path through the right manhole and which equipment I should bring, which tools I need, which spare pieces I need, which level of training I need. Maybe that's all just stored and collated in one place. So that'll kind of do me. Um, 
I think we kind of tick most of these boxes, certainly in terms of ambition. We can give you X-ray vision today. We can pop on a HoloLens and do that. I think it will take a while for the hardware to catch up with where we would like it to be. And I'll just run through these. I think the hardware has to look like this. It needs to kind of be a pair of safety glasses that lasts for eight hours, that's robust enough if you drop it. It probably needs to cost $200, because at the moment, anything that can do what I'm talking about is two or $3,000 that lasts for about an hour. Your field of view is about this size. If you drop it, it breaks. You're not allowed to wait outside, because if it gets wet, it, it dies. So we're not ready yet. I think we can build out the software and the solutions and the use cases and test them. And then when the, the hardware comes along or when Iron Man actually arrives, he's the best superhero because he didn't have any superpowers, actually. He just built them. He was a tech guy. So that'll do me. Um, so this, this is what it looks like today, and that's where we need to get to for tomorrow. But thank you very much.